I wanted to bring today's episode to the podcast talking about adhesions, also known as scar tissue. We may think of these if you have endometriosis, block fallopian tubes, fibroids. We may not think of it if you have low AMH or high FSH or unexplained infertility. So these adhesions can develop typically after if there's been any surgery that you've had, if there's been car accidents, traumatic injury, sports injuries, um, even bladder infections, adhesions can form in the body. So this is a full body treatment to actually non-surgically remove these, these uh, adhesions and lots of success stories medically documented in peer-reviewed journals to be able to talk about the efficacy of this treatment. So it's really fascinating, especially with block fallopian tumors where we think there's no, you know, there's no hope and people with low AMH as low as zero getting pregnant after doing, doing this therapy. Obviously, we believe in a functional approach, looking at all the different stressors like gut infections, food sensitivities, environmental toxins, mental emotional stress, and this is a structural stress which may have been missed. So looking at your medical history and if you've got any of those things we talked about as far as certain surgeries or traumatic injury, it's, this is something for really to dig into and see how this potentially can help you get pregnant naturally. So feel free to leave a review on iTunes. I'm excited to announce that registration is now open for our Mindfulness Fertility Series. This is a six-week live online group program. This program has been run in a hospital fertility clinic setting for years, and we brought it online for the last four years. So lots of success stories. And really, this program is for you if you have an IUI or an IVF coming up and essential for anyone trying to get pregnant naturally. So this program will help you if you are stuck right now, catastrophizing about the future or ruminating about the past will help you reframe your thoughts, reduce anxiety, and create a solid mindset for success. We only run this program two times per year. The next class is not scheduled until fall 2020, but class starts Thursday, January the 30th for this round. If it feels right for you, all you need to do is go to Fab Fertile, F-A-B Fertile, click on shop and then mindfulness to register. That's Fab Fertile, F-A-B Fertile, click on shop and mindfulness. Space is very limited. If it feels right for you, we would love to have you join us. One theme that keeps coming up with the couples in our Fab Fertile Couples Coaching Program is sleep. Whether it's insomnia, having a hard time falling asleep, waking up at night, or feeling tired when we wake up, sleep is critical for fertility and hormones. And that's why I'm so excited to have Blue Blocks as our podcast sponsor. So we're exposed to blue and green light from our phones, our tablets, our computers, indoor lights, and more. And this exposure impacts our melatonin production. The melatonin is essential for both female and male fertility. It helps determine the frequency and duration of our cycle and impacts sperm. So the there's lots of blue light blocking glasses on the market, but the ones from Blue Blocks, they've actually compared other popular brands and Blue Blocks block 100% of blue and green light while other brands fall short. So I have their sleep glasses. They have red lenses and the ones I have are a little translucent frame and they're so stylish and really cool. And so they eliminate 100% of the blue and green light in the 400 nanometer to 550 nanometer range. So this is the exact range that has been shown in clinical studies to disrupt melatonin and negatively impact your sleep. So all you do is wear your sleep glasses after sunset until it's time for bed and you'll notice improved sleep after just one use. And it's also cool to use when you're flying for managing jet lag. I got to say, I was a little skeptical about the noticing uh, improvement after one use, but literally I, did, I use these glasses and my sleep is actually already pretty good. I use them for one day and I have to say after one day, I had the best sleep of my life. I just felt so rested. So these glasses, they ship free and they're tracked for all orders anywhere in the world. And also they have all their frames come in prescription, non-prescription and reading glasses. Plus you can send in your frames and they'll add the blue light blocking and green light blocking lenses to your frame. So this is an easy hack that you can add to your fertility toolkit. All you do is go to blue blocks, B-L-U, B-L-O-X.com. Use the coupon code get pregnant podcast at checkout and receive a 15% discount. That's blueblocks, B-L-U-B-L-O-X.com and use the coupon code getpregnantpodcast to receive your 15% discount. I didn't need to go to donor eggs. Obviously, mm-hmm. I don't regret it. I have beautiful children. I could have done things differently, restored. I was still cycling back in my in my 20s. I could have looked at my health, the environmental toxins, the stress I was under, 
Many, many women are being told their eggs are too old. That's often merely an assumption that's not based on actual evidence. The reason being that there is no direct test of egg quality. You can't test egg quality. It's the man who's got a food sensitivity or he has a zinc deficiency. Like there can be a root cause to these symptoms that are, you know, quote unquote, period problems that the doctor will pass you a pill without any question of why. And some part of you knows that if you can reframe your journey from not one of struggle, or if it is struggle, learn how to embrace the struggle. Learn how to embrace it. Most conditions in the child occur during the nine months of development. It's the, the genetic switches are turned on or turned off and they're pre-programmed. So you are in such a powerful, amazing position to do amazing things for your kids. You know, why is IVF the first step? Because we believe it should be the last step. Welcome to Get Pregnant Naturally, where functional medicine and natural fertility solutions will help you get pregnant and have your baby. Hey everyone, I'm Sarah Clark, and my mission is to inspire, motivate, and empower you. Most of all, I want you to wake up. So with functional medicine, we can discover what causes infertility and eventually reverse the condition. Today, I'm welcoming Larry and Belinda Warren to the podcast, and we're digging into how to use physical therapy to break up adhesions, also known as scar tissue. Larry Wern is the CEO of Clear Passages Therapy, and Belinda Wern is the Director of Services for Clear Passage. It's a network of physical therapy clinics in North America and the United Kingdom, treating pain, female infertility, bowel obstruction, and sexual dysfunction non-surgically. So over time, they found that their work improved fertility for many women and replaced major surgery for some serious adhesion-related conditions. Published studies measure the effects of their work in conditions previously only treated by surgery, including blocked fallopian tubes and small bowel obstructions. And before we jump into today's show, don't forget to hit the subscribe button on iTunes or wherever you're listening to this to make sure you never miss an episode. Hey, Larry and Belinda, excited to have you on the podcast. Yeah. Hi. Hi thank you for having Thanks us. Thanks for having us. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. So if you could share really how you came to do this work, I think you've got a bit of a story there. Yeah. Well, I've been a physical therapist since 1975. And in 84, uh, I was diagnosed with cervical cancer. And by the time they found it, it had spread toward my rectum. So they were hesitant to do a hysterectomy. So they were very aggressive with me. I had to have a lot of external as well as internal radiation therapy. And um, I'm still here at 68, but mm. <laughs> it basic, the radiation destroyed my ovarian function. So it threw me into menopause at 33. And I developed what's called a frozen pelvis where all my organs were glued together from adhesions or internal scar tissue from the radiation. So I, I, I must have seen, I don't know, six, seven, or maybe eight doctor specialists. And I got really tired of hearing it's all in your head or you have to learn to live with it. And at 33, that was not acceptable. I started traveling all over the country, getting treated by therapists that did different kinds of hands-on techniques and anyone that helped me, you know, I, I, and then Larry started studying with them. We were able to get me out of pain and ready to go back to work full time. So that's when we opened our first private practice in 89, treating people with complex chronic pain due to adhesions. Basically, we had no intention of treating female infertility. I'm just mm. a guy who loved his wife. She was, had debilitating pain due mm. to adhesions the internal scars that form in us all due to surgery or infection or endometriosis and adhesions go together like salt and pepper. So we were treating Belinda, trying to figure out a way to decrease her adhesions without surgery, which tends to cause more adhesions. Women started reporting to us that we treated, gee, I'm getting pregnant and it's very unusual. I've been diagnosed with blocked fallopian tubes. Mm. I've had blocked fallopian tubes for seven years in the first, first one's case. We were within the first year of our private practice, we were treating a woman with a, a work-related slip and fall injury. And um, she had headaches, neck pain, back and tailbone pain. And she had had a myomectomy. She had a, a fibroid removed from her uterus. So she had the bikini line incision and it, it healed really, it keloided. It was real bumpy, lumpy. So she asked if we would work on her scar while we were treating, you know, the rest of her. And we said, of course. So she came in one day and said, Belinda, you're not going to believe what my gynecologist told me. And I said, what's that? She said, I'm pregnant. I said, that's great. Congratulations. And she said, wait, you don't understand. She'd had the HSG dye test done seven years 
prior to our treatment. So she knew both of her tubes were totally blocked. Wow. So she hadn't bothered using birth control. So it was a big surprise to all of us. Yeah. <laughs> and she, she wasn't married, but she was in a long-term relationship. So but they got married and had a little boy. So, oh, And that's kind of how you, so you, 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 you're focusing on chronic pain and fertility. And there's a couple other things you're focusing on too, I think. Yeah, really, you know, our focus really is, is on adhesions. It's, it's on mechanical infertility. Physician heard about this patient that we treated. And he said, do you think you helped? We said, well, we were treating there a lot. He sent four other women, two of them had black fallopian tubes, three of them became pregnant after we treated, including the ones with black fallopian tubes. So we wrote to the um, we wrote to the gynecologist in our university town, large medical facilities here at the University of Florida, and uh, most of the gynecologists kind of didn't know what to make of us. <laughs> Chief of staff of the hospital called me and and said, Mr. Warren, what is this about opening black fallopian tubes you've written to people about? And I said, well, he says, I'm a, I'm a surgeon, gynecologist. I do surgery twice a week and I have for 35 years. I'm a good surgeon. What is this that you're claiming? And, and I gave him a half dozen charts. And Sarah, he looks at one. He looks at the other. He's kind of scratched his chin. Looks at the third one. He, he says, Mr. Warren, you're doing things with your hands. I don't think I could do surgically. And I'm a good surgeon. I said, hmm. is that okay? And he said, well, yeah. He said, it's, it's fascinating. Are, are you doing any research? I said, no. Would you like to? Well, yes, we'd love to. He said, Mr. Warren, this is important. I, I think we need to um, study this and to write some write up some studies and examine this and see if these are flukes or what. So that's where we started. Shall I go on a little bit? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I'd like to hear about the medical studies. But maybe I want to wonder if we should back up a little bit to say, okay, so we, uh, we sure. described what adhesions were, but so how do we know if we have adhesions? Adhesions are a natural part of the healing process that form after anyone has had any kind of surgery or trauma. And we look at lifetime trauma, car accidents, falling off horses or falling off your bicycle, falling downstairs after infections or any inflammatory conditions like endometriosis. Adhesions form trying to protect the areas, you know, where there was tissue damage or trauma or tissues were cut. So, I mean, you know, if, we, if anyone has had a surgery or trauma or infection or endo, um, we know they have ad adhesions because mm -hmm. that's, that's how the body heals. And the way the adhesions form is sort of like a spider web. So they not only heal any areas that were cut or, or traumatized, but they can and do start sticking to anything and everything in the vicinity that can cause pain and many different kinds of symptoms, and they can also decrease the ability of some of the organs to function at 100%. It's like things are being squeezed and pulled on. Female reproductive tract is so delicate. And if you've ever seen, for example, the ins an electron microscope of uh, the inside of a fallopian tube, it looks like this beautiful, lush uh, underwater garden, but it's designed to carry a single a cell, the egg, and and single cell, the sperm. Those delicate little organs and delicate little structures do not do well when being glued down. So, as this, when adhesions form, when this tissue starts to heal, once you have healed, whether it's because you've had um, just time or you've taken antibiotics or, or, or you've healed from the surgery. Once you've healed, those adhesions remain there. Uh, if, once they're there, they've been there for seven to 10 days, they're there for life. And so it, it forms these little straight jackets in the body and it's glue-like. So in the female reproductive tract, whether it's in the tubes or on the fimbria, those little delicate fingers that pick up the egg from the ovary, or whether it's on the ovarian wall or even inside the muscle of the ovary or the cervix, they bind structures together so they're just not, not moving, they're not mobile, and so they're not as functional as they were now prior to, to when those adhesions laid down. Yeah, and then the current treatments for adhesions with typically surgery then, like excision surgery for, usually more for, for endometriosis, but like what else are you seeing surgery for? Um, C-sections, of course. C-sections, oh, yeah. fibroids. Um, yeah, ob yeah, obviously, yeah. yeah. And just exploratory surgery, like let's just take a look inside there and see what's going on. We know you have pain. Um, let's just take a look. So that's all well and good, but no matter how brilliant, skilled, or compassionate the surgeon they pretty much have the deck stacked against them as far as um, uh, they're going to, generally speaking, uh, create more adhesions. And the literature is pretty clear in that. Mm -hmm. Then obviously, with so with the adhesions related to infertility, can you talk a little bit more about that? With the, blo with the blocked tubes, obviously there, but... 
Any, anything else? Now, now, it was, well, first of all, Block Tibbs, when we, when the chief staff of the hospital joined us, and he stayed with us for about 30 years, he eventually left the hospital, but stayed with us, um, just retired. But he said, you know, these Block Tibbs, it's a perfect way for us to, to test the, test your work, because we can do a dye test before and after and see if you've opened the tubes or not. So we can keep score. We can check on pregnancies afterwards and see how that goes. So, so the block tubes, that was, that was one area. But when we looked at the, even when you have an HSG test, Sarah, that hysterosalpingogram where they run a catheter, a straw up into the, through the cervix into the uterus, and you can see the uterine cavity, and you'll see these on our website. Before we treat, it often looks like the inside of the uterus, that is the area where this dye goes, is tightened and restricted it's more like a a, a column than uh, that's being squeezed where the uterus itself is being squeezed by these little micro adhesions that can form in between muscle cells after we treat you can see in the after images that uterine cavity is open uh, it's more mobile we can palpate it and feel the mobility changes are are huge well, when there's pain, pain generally decreases. Intercourse pain is decreases in virtually everyone that comes to us with intercourse pain. And incidentally, the main side effect, we were a little embarrassed to do a study on until the chief of staff insisted, was increased sexual function because women started calling saying they're having orgasms like they'd never had before or increased lubrication and, and libido. And so we actually ended up testing it. It ends up you can test that. So, so I'm not sure if I exactly answered your question, but uh, that's that ended up being the primary uh, side effect, which we presented at the American Society for Reproductive Medicine and Fertility and Sterility Journal. Um, ran that abstract in, well, in their that, journal. That's a good side effect. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Especially if you're trying to get pregnant and you have pain with intercourse, you know, mm. that it makes a a huge difference when, you know, they're able to have sex and it doesn't hurt. Absolutely. Now I've interviewed someone, um, a pelvic floor therapist. How are you different, the same from that technique? We look at the body um, very three-dimensionally. Most pelvic floor therapists, um, they they may do um, some internal like, vaginal massage. Mm -hmm. um, we we work externally on, on the organs and like all the organs in the abdomen are supposed to be supposed abdomen and pelvis are supposed to be able to slide and glide and move over and around each other. And as things get glued down, you know, it starts causing symptoms and, and problems. So um, we we do so we treat the pelvic area internally as well as externally. And um, we we don't really do massage. I mean, we don't use lotion. We we need the friction against the adhered areas and stretching adhered areas uh, until things soften and, and get freed up. Most pelvic floor therapists do a little bit of massage and, and they use electric stim and, and different modalities. And we just use our hands. Yeah. The other thing is most, most of the pelvic floor therapists I know of are, are working with muscles and to, want you to do several hundred kegels a day or squeeze against my hand or, or against my fingers. And, and so they're getting muscles out of spasm, which is great. What we're treating is these tiny, are these tiny strands of collagen. They're like the strands of a nylon rope, but they're very strong. They're, they're been estimated at about 2,000 pounds a square inch, type 2 collagen, that lay down and attach from one cell to the other, to the other, to the other, like a glue. And what I hired a double PhD because I wanted to know why we were doing so well. And the chief of staff loved that, that we hired some PhDs. But I said, what, what is it that we're doing? Well, there are, as these strands attach to each other and they're very strong, there's a, a chemical mechanical bond that attaches each strand to the next one and the next one and then the underlying structure. As we treat, we ha are focusing on that on that bond and on decreasing those strands from each other. So it's more of an old and a strong mechanical force rather than helping muscles relax, if, if, if that makes sense to you. Mm -hmm. And what about the similarity to um, Ayurvedo massage? 
I don't know much about our vagal massage. I know they treat externally. Um, they try to align the, the uterus. Um, probably the main difference between us and almost all of the others is that we've got about a dozen studies published in peer-reviewed PubMed index journals so that we can look somebody in the eye and say, you know, this is what our results are in treating endometriosis caused uh, infertility and then treating PCOS or pre-IVF, some people come to us for, or blocked fallopian tubes. So it's easy when you're first treating, you have a success or two and you feel like, you say, I helped that or I helped that. But once you've actually gone through the trouble of hiring PhDs and biostatisticians and physicians to go through and measure results on hundreds of women and actually come up with quantifiable results, then you've given them to the biostatistician who runs probability values to say, what are the chances that any of this happened by chance or that it's real or confidence index levels? It's it's time consuming, it's expensive, but we feel like it's 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 important and it's worth it mm-hmm. to be able to look people in the eye and say, this, this is what our results are and mm-hmm. this is what our chances are probably with you. And okay, so let's that's some manual therapy. So what what does it look like? If someone comes in and they have can you walk us through uh, like what this like if someone came in with endometriosis and and what would you do? Well, we we palpate and you know, feel and we check all the organs in the abdomen and pelvis and see which ones have restricted mobility and we um, we check their pelvic level, the pelvis, both, both pelvic bones need to be mobile and balanced and symmetrical. Um, we review uh, their medical history um, to see, you know, if they had surgeries or traumas or, or endo. So, you know, the first hour that, that we're with any patient, we do a very thorough initial evaluation so we can form a treatment plan and know, you know, what needs to be addressed um, during the treatment. All the treatment that we do is is just using our hands mm-hmm. and freeing up um, whichever organs and tissues are we find are adhered. It might be, um, you know, some of the, the ligaments that attach the uterus to the pelvis are restricted or tighter than they should be. Um, some of the bladder ligaments may be tighter than they should be. Um, some of the, you know, either of the ovaries or tubes, um, you know, we we treat whatever we find is adhered, you know, and try to get all the the organs that surround all the reproductive organs as mobile uh, as possible. So, you know, symptoms start to get better and go away and the organs can function more normally. It's like we're very gradually peeling apart tissues and structures that are stuck together that shouldn't be. So it's sort of like we're gradually peeling the straight jacket off of these organs. So then things, pain starts to get better and go away and the organs can function more normally. You know, it's like we're just very gradually peeling things apart, you know, and when things are mo- more mobile, um, things start working better, organs start working better and, and pain symptoms start to get better. And what about the process? Is it the process painful as you're manipulating the organs? Like how is that for the, for the client or the patient? We'd like, we tell everyone, to, we invite everyone first of all to, to be a member of the treatment team. Quite literally, we want them giving their feedback and their thoughts as well, as well as their discomfort level. And if it gets if it gets uncomfortable, let me know. Give me a zero to ten. You know, if it gets up to six or seven, and that's that's plenty. Um, let's just stay there. So, a lot of times there's there's no discomfort at all. Sometimes it can feel uh, a bit achy. I'd like to add a little something to what Belinda said previously. Mm-hmm. And that, and I, and I can do that by example. And that is, we do a very thorough uh, medical history review. This one woman came to us. I remember she she was just finishing up her PhD here at the university, and she said, "Well, I've been with this local reproductive endocrinologist for two years now, and he's he's given up on me. He's you know." I'm a, I'm never going to become pregnant," he said. "I could maybe get donor eggs, but that's it." And we we looked at her history, and we saw that she had had an automobile accident. She had had a pretty significant hip injury. This is in the beginning when we knew very little about uh, treating infertility. But we looked at the structure of the pelvis, and we realized, you know, Sarah, right where the inside of the of your femur, your leg, comes into your pelvis, just on the other side, there, a half inch away, is where the fimbria, the end of the fallopian tube, picks up the 
gig from the ovary. We said, you know, Joe, I wonder if, if maybe when she got injured, um, that, that that area had to heal and that the body was not thinking I'm going to be in the reproductive system or an orthopedic system or just in the joint. So uh, we treated, so we concentrated quite a bit of treatment there, palpated there, felt where things were adhered, spent quite a bit of time. It feels to us like pulling out the run in the sweater when we're doing this, hmm. because these adhesions don't really form just in the reproductive tract. They may form in the test to any structures in that area. And so we treated her. She became pregnant. She's now had her third child naturally so that's so that's a little bit of a different approach the way we look at it doing a very thorough history on on patients to see where where have you healed what has your body uh, gone through during this healing process and then taking down adhesions it's like taking your body back in time from the time these these little very strong very powerful uh, microscopic crosslinks uh, formed so um so there's there's an example of of sort of how it's different yeah that's great and so with the medical history what are some typical red flags you talked about there's a car accident or a hip injury like what are things that some people could say oh wait i've had that it's like what do you think oh that's a red flag we need to dig deeper well i mean we look at their history of have you had any surgeries have you had any kind of traumatic incident um do you have endo a, a lot of you know many of our patients uh, have had sports related injuries or we've seen a lot of cheerleaders and if you and gym, gymnasts and you know if you think about how many times they've fallen and landed on their butt you know that that trauma you know the energy the impact uh, you know, they develop adhesions that affects all the pelvic organs. Anyone that's had bladder or vaginal infections. I mean, yeah, well, chlamydia, bladder chlamydia. Infections. Not, not the chlamydia, yeah. the bladder infections. <laughs> the bladder infections. Oh. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, the vagina, you know, is subject to so many things coming into it that, um, you know, the abortions also, um, adhesions form and, you know, from, from the vagina or the uterus, they can and, and do tend to spread out into the tubes causing tubal blockage. So the adhesions form for in you know, a bladder vaginal infection, as Belinda was saying, things are going inside of, of a woman from the outer world. This is uh, not, they're not always perfectly clean. Um, then this bacteria enters into a warm, moist, dark environment. It's a perfect place for mm -hmm. life to grow, including bacterial infections, which some of which can be um, subclinical, not even diagnosed, but the, once the infection has cleared, whether you've taken an antibiotic or whatever, or it's just gone away on its own, the adhesions that formed to fight that infection in the first place remain. And they remain on these delicate tissues so that if you're having miscarriages or you're having, um, it, it, it just creates a less hospitable organ for implantation when when you've got adhesions even micro adhesions forming on the inside of it yeah that's very interesting i i had chronic bladder infections and we see a lot of people with chronic bladder bladder infections and i mine was when i i figured out the food sensitivities and gut infections and they went away but yeah mm -hmm. I'm, obviously i haven't addressed the potentially then there's you're saying potentially there's adhesions mm -hmm. uh, and we see this a lot with our clients having bladder infections any any other red flags that we would miss i think that's that's mainly it it's it, it he's just formed from injury infection inflammation and trauma um so i mean you can certainly get it he's just from radiation therapy though we see more just the unexplained you know just you the sports injuries that happen and, and like this woman that was in a car accident or, or you have a you had a baby and now you had a C-section. Now you've had a second C-section. Maybe it was a serious uh, surgery and serious adhesions formed from that. So, so um, like that, any, any of those. Yeah, I've had two C-sections. Great. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, can you can you just t take us through? So, like, how long does this take? Like, as far as did someone to see some results, or it just kind of take us through? Maybe like you've, you've mentioned a couple of case studies, but just kind of take us through the process. How long does it take in each stage, and do they do things at home, or I, yeah, what does it look like? I'll take the beginning of this just because we had a gentleman in town, who, a physician who was reading our X-rays, and he called his father, who was a researcher at NI at National Institute of health and said, Dad, these people are opening block fallopian tubes. 
His dad got fascinated, came down, double PhD himself, and started studying us. And um, I asked Dr. Wickman, said, how many hours does it take for us to open black fallopian tubes? Because there in the beginning, that was the main focus. And he studied us and he said, well, it takes 16.2 hours. Okay. We had some coming from out of town that would come and that start Monday and that'd be done Friday. And we had some that were locals. And so we designed a 20-hour program. Um, and he said, there's no statistical difference at all if a person, if a woman gets that treatment uh, over the course of five days or even four days. In most cases, it's five. They'll come in on a, fly in on a weekend, start Monday morning, have two hours of therapy Monday morning, a lot of which is the initial evaluation Belinda talked about. Mm -hmm. Then have a break for lunch and then two hours in the afternoon, no drugs, no surgery, just we'll have her walk or swim, um, sing, sometimes get some movement in the area, do a jacuzzi. And then the same thing, uh, four hours the next day and the next uh, for five days. So that's four hours a day for, which, sorry, our dog is, <laughs> have some up to set to me. <laughs> so it's. So we, so we designed a 20-hour program, which okay. seemed to, to be convenient and effective. And that's what all of our published data is, is based on. So 20 hours, and then you do the, this is for, for blocked tubes, and you would then see that there's the, the tubes are no longer blocked. Well, you know, we, we suggest that, I mean, it's not mandatory, but, um, you know, some, some patients want to know definitely if, you know, if the treatment made a difference. So we suggest mm -hmm. getting a that they wait at least two weeks after they complete treatment and then get a follow-up HSG and we can compare it to the pre-treatment HSG and see, you know, did the dye go further? Did the dye spill out? Um, we, we also show patients um, a home program and self-treatment techniques so they'll know enough things to do um, once they go home to uh, using their own hands. Um, we have different tools that have different uh, size round knobs. Um, and, you know, we show them enough things that they can do to hopefully maintain the improvements that they've gained from our, our, our treatment with them. Yeah, does it slip back or you need to you need to continue to do this at home or but once you've gone through the 20-hour protocol, then? Generally with female infertility, that's the 20-hour program is mm -hmm. it. I would like to mention a little bit about IFSH and low AMH, yeah. if, yeah, if that's okay. I know that's an area that's of interest to you. Absolutely. Um, we had so so these women were coming to us with block tubes or unexplained infertility and or endometriosis related so it's it's not just for block tubes i mean adhesions form anywhere in the reproductive system and they they just they glue things down so that they're not as effective so um we had very high uh, success rate as far as our pre-ivfs i think the success rates were three to five times the sart uh, society for assisted reproductive techniques three to five times their rates when when we saw them before ivf but um this woman comes so women would come to us sometimes they're in that say well you know, I I have high FSH. You know, my doctor I've tried to get have an IVF, and but my FSH is twelve or eighteen or thirty. Um, and, and can you help me? And, and we didn't know, so we asked our gynecologist. By this time, Doctor King is our unpaid uh, medical advisor and research advisor. He's never never asked us for a cent. And so we asked him, and he said, "You know, Larry," he said, "I, I can see where you're helping the mechanics of sperm meat egg, but." Uh, and implantation as well, but I you know that's hormonal. I, I just don't think you can help that. So this woman comes in, she has severe scarring, pelvic scarring, a lot of pain with intercourse and pelvic pain, and we're treating her. And I did not realize that in the prior three months, she that she was actually an infertility patient, that her FSH levels were 18 one month, 19 the next, and then 28 the next. So she was considered um, in full into menopause. Mm -hmm. So while, I'm, while we're treating her, it happened to be a Thursday afternoon, I, I looked at her cranium, I looked at her, her, at her head, and things just didn't look quite symmetrical, and I kind of measured a few things. and thought, well, should I spend a little, some time here? I mean, she really came in for all this pelvic pain and scarring, but we try to treat the whole body, and we do. So um, we treat the tailbone, and it pulls all the way up through the dura it, to the cranial base and into the cranium. At any rate, so I treated her for about five or ten minutes there on Thursday, and then again on Friday. Um, she goes back home the next month, and she gets pregnant, naturally. 
And her RA, her reproductive physician, says, you can't be pregnant. You're in menopause. She says, I assure you, I am. And she was. So we went back. To, so this is how we we work, following the scientific method, Sarah. We, we went to the chief of staff and said, well, what do we do about this? And should we treat these women or not? And he said, Larry, not only should you treat them, but go ahead and get their FSH levels before and after you treat so that you know, you know, you'll be able to measure and find out if this was a fluke or not. So this is called developing science. Um, it's the scientific method. So I said, how many should we treat? Well, I asked the biostatistician, so I called the high head of biostatistics statistics at the med school he says uh, gives me all these formulas but he says basically eight he says eight or more ought to give us a pretty good idea so so we started accepting these women with high fsh um so by the time i looked back it was two years later and we had treated 16 and i gave the data to the biostat and he said larry of the 16 women that came in with high fsh infertile due to high fsh Six of them became pregnant before they got a chance to check their FSH after therapy. Yeah. Of the other 10, nine of them, their FSH decreased. And in most cases, it plummeted. And the first woman is now, two years later, pregnant naturally with her second child. Mm. So we went, huh, <laughs> this, is, this is really neat. So, so it's an area that we've, that we've spent some time investigating as well. Now on that one, are you seeing, so you're doing your full medical history. Do you find that it with the high FSH, the low AMH, is it coming back to the car accidents, the hip in, like the injuries, the surgery, like that kind of stuff? Or, or what are you seeing on the medical history that, uh, is there any kind of similarity? I don't know. Uh, yeah, usually they've, they've had some sort of sur- you know, pelvic surgery, you know, appendectomy, um, you know, fiber, myomectomy, fibroid removal, yeah. um, and also car accidents and, and falls. And, you know, the, we, we look at the body very three-dimensionally, um, much more like osteopaths do. You know, we believe that structure and function are intimately interrelated. And, um, it, you know, if you picture your body being knit like a sweater, the, the fascia is our connective tissue. And, and there are three layers of it. The, the outer layer blends with the skin. So it's sort of like a body stocking. And the deeper layers, like the sweater, it surrounds, supports, and separates everything in the body, the bones, muscles, organs, nerves, blood vessels, everything. And the deepest layer of fascia is called the dura, the dura mater, and it surrounds and protects the brain and spinal cord. So it has strong attachments at the base of the skull, the second and third cervical vertebrae, and then it comes down around the spinal cord through the rest of the vertebrae and has strong attachments on the sacrum and and the coccyx, the tailbone. So if if anyone has had a fall or a car accident or or surgery, literally due to the the connections from, from head you know, from top to bottom, pelvic adhesions absolutely can and do create a downward drag or tension all the way up into the head and neck that can cause headaches um, and also affect hormones. You know, the pituitary gland sits deep in the middle of the skull, you know, sort of straight back from the bridge of the nose. And um, so, you know, we, fre- we do frequently see um, high FSH levels and in women who've had some sort of uh, traumatic event. Yeah. What more do you see what not nothing to do with a head injury or anything? Oh yeah, absolutely. Head injury, um you know, injury to anywhere in the body, you know, you know, if you fall or if you get in a car accident, you get a whiplash. It's yeah. like you have a whole body lash. I mean, it, you know, it doesn't just affect the, the low back, it doesn't just affect the neck. Um you know, concussions it, it, and things it, like yeah. that to yeah, yeah, because the the pituitary hypothalamus is, is is totally covered with the same membrane that is this dura mater that cl- that covers the spinal cord all the way up from the tailbone all the way up to the base of the skull and into the head. So treating anywhere anywhere along that area, I think, with what Belinda's saying is that can be injured, whether it's at the cranium or at the neck or all the way down to the tailbone, your tailbone's forward. And gosh, I can't sit comfortably in the movies because I have hurts. to move around. Sex hurts. Mm-hmm. feels like my husband, my partner's hitting something and partner actually is because your tailbone's forward. But that's pu- that can pull down on the entire dura, creating a, a, a often headaches that start at the base of the skull and uh, pull all the way up into the cranium and exert a pressure on this delicate 
organ, the master gland of female reproduction, that's the size of a pea. Yeah, and the pituitary gland has a very intimate and, and very important uh, communication loop with the ovaries. So if the cranial bones are lopsided or some of them on, on one side of the, the, the skull are restricted, it can, you know, can affect the, the communication between the pituitary telling the ovary when to release eggs. Yeah. So, but the, but the, the therapy you're doing though, am I wrong with this? It's in the abdomen, or you're doing it all? Where are else are you doing it? Uh, we we treat the whole body. I mean, okay. we we start typically we'll start uh, in the pelvic area, in the abdominal area, and making sure that the pelvic bones are level, the legs are even, and then as the week and you know working on the, the abdominal and pelvic organs, and then as the week progresses, we'll work up in, you know up the back into the okay. the head neck. Um, chest. I mean, we, we treat the whole body. Um, okay. And is there any negative side effects from doing this? No, we, we've run, as should be done in any scientific studies, we run adverse events. And the adverse events we see are temporary and generally some soreness, some low back pain, sometimes some emotional distress during the week of therapy there's a it's a theory advanced in scientific american uh magazine that um, memory is stored not just in the brain but in these facets throughout mm -hmm. the body and we think maybe that's part of that but um the main other side effects we see are decreased back pain and increased desire arousal lubrication orgasm and satisfaction decreased pain those are the six domains of sexual function we've been able to measure. And those really came across as total side effects. As a matter of fact, really all of this came across as something we weren't trying to do. We weren't trying to open black fallopian tubes. Mm -hmm. We weren't trying to decrease um, in endometriosis pain. We didn't even know what endometriosis was in the <laughs> beginning when the first patient told us that, you know, I, my period came and, and went. I, I can't believe it. I didn't even know it was coming. I, I, you know, I've had pain every, for two or three days every month since my period first started because I had end I have endometriosis. And we said, oh, that's great. And, and she left and Belinda and I turned to each other and said, What's endometriosis, <laughs> <laughs> you know? But that, because we were treating adhesions, but this, mm -hmm. that was 30 years ago. So we never really set out to do any of, to treat any specific conditions. We were just trying to decrease adhesions. And as people started reporting, wow, this is happening and that's happening. We did kind of, as I described with the FSAs, went to the, to the chief of staff, went to the biostatisticians and went to the PhDs and said, you know, is this real and is this useful? And when it was, we would follow it up. So, um, that's what we've done all the for 30 years. And so where I know you have a number of clinics, but where where can they so they need to come into your place for that um for that 20 hour program? Like what does that look like and where where can they go? The first thing people should do is go to our website which is clearpassage.com so clear as we were clearing passages and read about read about us and what we do and see if it makes sense to you. You can complete a medical history questionnaire there and send that in and we'll review that and we'll we'll see if if we think we can help you we'll tell you if we don't think we can help you we'll tell you that a woman decides she wants to come in we'll say well we we have clinics located in california we have them in the middle of the country in florida it's in gainesville florida is where our headquarters is that's where we do all of our training and our main therapist belinda and i are um or london and canterbury england um, so, but everything really goes through the website and goes through headquarters first so that yeah. we can look at histories and say, uh, yeah, we can help this person. Mm -hmm. Also or, New York. Oh, oh yeah. New York, New York City. St. Louis, South Florida. Yeah. I, I got in a bad car accident in 2001 and so I couldn't work again for, for several months. So I, I was, as I got treated at the clinic and started writing a therapist training manual because we'd had quite a few physical therapists contact us and say, how can we learn what you do? Mm -hmm. um, so it turned into a four-year OCD project. It's now about 550 pages. So we put together, <laughs> we've put together a clinical internship training program. So um, we gr we've grown very slowly because, you know, it's, it's, it's vitally important to us to keep make sure that the quality is consistent throughout all of our clinics, you know, so we'll feel confident 
you know, if someone prefers, if someone lives in New York and they want to see our Manhattan therapist, you know, we know, you know, we know how she works and that she's doing the techniques the same way as if that, that person came you know, to the home office in Florida. And so they can only get it at these, at these locations then throughout the States and a couple in um, the UK. That's correct. Okay. Yes. And then well, they were to come there and then, then there's some at home exercises, but that's only after they've had the in-person. That's correct. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Great. And so now my question here, so is there, do you have a, a book or a website or an app or a documentation, uh, documentary, anything you guys are obsessed with right now? We're going to obviously recommend your uh, link to your website and your information, but anything you're obsessed with uh, in general? <laughs> well, uh, the first, the first book we, we wrote was 600 and something pages, not the therapist training manual, but uh, it was a, a real tome of with 80 patient narratives in it. I've now we've we recently wrote a smaller book which is available at Amazon called Adhesions, uh, the inner body's inner inner menace, I believe. It's it's we tried to make it really reasonable. It's under ten dollars there or for ninety nine cents through Kindle. We are trying to consolidate all of our data to make it very legible. So if you go to our published studies page, it has about a dozen of those published studies. So you'll see graphs there of success rates and mm, right. down to two decimal points and stuff like that. So we're just uh we get several hundred inquiries a month, and we try to answer each person really. Um, it's my, the main question our, our staff a- asks when people call is, "And what else?" Because we like to we like to hear what's going on, and, and we do ask people, "What do you, what do you feel is, is is going on for yourself?" Yeah, I have the same question. <laughs> yes, yeah. you we, did good for you. We yeah, I mean we look we. You know, through my experience and hearing it's all in your head or you have to learn to live with it, you know, our patients feel so uh, validated. And, you know, we look to them as like, hey, you're the expert of your body. You've lived in it your whole life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, from my, you know, all our experiences, it's like if doctors would listen to their patients, they would really learn a lot, you know. Mm -hmm. And I mean, a lot of our patients have experienced unfortunately physical and sexual abuse and just being heard and you know telling them that what they're feeling there's a real reason why they're having these symptoms it's not in their you know not in their head our patients feel very uh, supported and you know even if people don't end up coming for treatment we really believe um it's vitally it's so important to educate people about their own bodies so uh, we have uh, 450 web pages we really believe in educating people so they can make uh, educated decisions you know about what to do for themselves now if there has been sexual abuse is that are you seeing adhesions there or what what are you seeing with that well we treat men as well as women mm. um yeah i mean men i don't know but you know um abuse it, it's it, it's traumatic i mean mm-hmm. especially if there's a physical or sexual component um it creates adhesions absolutely you know uh, violent sex uh, yeah yeah i mean the, the body's going to respond by laying down adhesions trying to protect those areas so they can heal and during treatment like larry mentioned a lot of times emotional stuff will come up it's it's like a a body memory it's you know stored in in different areas of the body different tissues and when those areas are treated it, it's like a flashback it's like you know it allows the person a chance to release those those memories and get that energy out of their body so the, you know it takes a lot of energy to yeah. stuff things like that down to shove it down and not deal with it and um, it can be very you know, profoundly healing to you know have an emotional release you know when when areas that were physically traumatized get treated the, the other area that, that that i guess we haven't even mentioned because it's an infertility podcast i know you have so many of your clients are health care providers mm-hmm. i think about 40 percent of our clients are also health care providers mm-hmm. or their spouses and um after we started, we'll treat patients that the young man fell asleep in the back of the car and woke up mm-hmm. when his brother hit a tree. He was impaled on the on the stick shift and tore, his, tore him open, ruptured his pancreas and spleen, and he was life flighted to the hospital. Serious um, traumas, we, we do see those quite a bit um, it, because the surgeons don't want to do any more surgery and they know they're going to create adhesions. 
about 10 years ago, a rock and roll singer out West saw the called and said, you guys open those little tubes. How about bigger tubes? And we said, what do you mean? How about um, the bowel obstructions? I said, mm. What are you talking about? Well, I've, I've had seven surgeries in the last 30 months for adhesions and bowel obstructions. And the, they've scheduled my eighth surgery at Whipple. They're going to take out a third of my half of my stomach and, and, everything they said that adhesions can attach to they're killing me can can you help bowel obstruction so we said well makes sense so if you'd like to come in we'll treat you well she came in she, she was able to eat after about the th eat normal food uh solid food for the first time in weeks after about the first three days of therapy she went back home after a week was able to cancel her surgery has not had a surgery in 10 and a half years hmm. and we just published a controlled study in the World Journal of Gastroenterology because people who have bowel obstructions, which are caused by adhesions, mm -hmm. have surgery, and then that creates another bowel obstruction. It's the primary cause. So, And we decreased in this controlled phase two study, decreased the incidence of bowel obstruction by 15 times the norm. So, so that's another area we're branching out into. We've not abandoned. We started with chronic pain. We treat plenty of chronic pain, do well with infertility, but we also see a lot of, of just trauma and and adhesions and now uh, recurring bowel obstructions. It's become a lifesaver. So we feel really blessed because we feel like we're giving life on the one hand and saving lives on the other. Mm -hmm. So it's so hard with, to stop with, treating. With IBD <laughs> or colitis or, or um, Crohn's? Yeah. Oh, yeah. We see a lot of people with, with Crohn's, yeah. Yeah, all of those. SIBO, small intestinal bacterial yeah. overgrowth as well. Mm -hmm. There's an image on our website that we have before and after results of a Crohn's patient. She was scheduled for emergency surgery. Part of her intestines was a stricture, which, as you know, is an arrowing. Look, it was a three-inch string stricture. It looked like a coffee straw, the inside of her intestines, uh, in, in one area. and the other area, it was an hourglass stricture. After we treated her, she, they canceled the surgery because they said it's normal bowel. Mm -hmm. There was no stricture at all. So. And in follow-ups, uh, radiographic studies. It's pretty dramatic. It's been fun and exciting yeah, and that's... really exciting getting before and afters that are objective and not from us and from third parties that are saying, you know, this is mm -hmm. I love it. really neat. Great. So you have an ebook chapter uh, that they can download. They can go to clearpassage.com forward slash infertility. What can they expect in that um ebook chapter those are i think we have chapters there on from our 600 page book mm -hmm. of every single condition the first two or three chapters are all about adhesions how they form what we do about them and then each chapter thereafter has specifics on black fallopian tubes for example with patient stories as well and then on endometriosis ifsh um pcos on and on so you can kind of download whatever chapters you want depending on the condition you're interested in excellent well this was fascinating uh, thank you so much uh, larry and belinda for coming on and sharing your words of wisdom on this on this topic it was uh, yeah really uh, really interesting yeah absolutely thanks so much for having us we really appreciate your good work it, it just sounds wonderful i mean addressing the food and and fertility is it makes so much sense you know you yeah. your body has to function well and you have to treat your body right and to so the work that you're doing we applaud as well sarah oh thank you very much if you are over researching obsessed with dr google find yourself up at 3 a.m worrying about the future you'll begin to realize the absolute power of the mind body connection as you let go of control and lean into the flow class starts thursday january the 30th space is very limited go to fab fertile fab fertile click on shop and mindfulness fertility series to join us Melatonin is important for female fertility. It helps regulate hormones and maintain the body's circadian rhythms. Plus, it helps determine the frequency and duration of the menstrual cycle. Plus, it impacts sperm count and motility. Blue and green light negatively impact our melatonin production. That's why we recommend blue blocks, blue and green light sleep classes to all our one-to-one -one clients. Simply go to blue blocks, B-L-U, B-L-O-X dot com and use the coupon code get pregnant podcast at checkout to receive your 15% discount. That's blue blocks, B L U B L O X.com and use the coupon code get pregnant podcast. 
The Get Pregnant Naturally podcast, including show notes and links, provides information with respect to healthy living, nutrition, lab testing, and is intended for informational purposes only. The information provided is not a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment, nor is it to be construed as such. We cannot guarantee that the information provided on the Get Pregnant Naturally podcast reflects the most up-to-date medical research. Information is provided without representation or warranties of any kind. Please consult a qualified physician for medical advice and always seek the advice of a qualified health care provider with any questions you may have regarding your health and nutrition program.